In a distant country, a brutal assassination is about to take place. The assassins hover over their target. They're in a helicopter. Their target is powerful, more so than any political figure, and highly regarded. They take aim, and they shoot. The target is sedated. The assassins sever a body part from him or her, and the target is left for dead. Mission accomplished. Meanwhile, in a hotel room in Las Vegas, a dangerous deal is going down. Lives have been lost in this deal already, but it's far too late to turn back. The stage is set. The dealer removes the merchandise from a fancy silver suitcase and lays it right on the carpet. Are you pleased with it? He asks the buyer. The buyer pulls out a brown sack from the hotel room safe. 55 grand in cash. It's a lot less what the item is worth per pound, but on the black market, beggars can't be choosers. The dealer counts the money. It's all there. What he just sold is almost impossible to get, but it's worth more than gold. It's worth more than diamonds, more than just about anything on the black market today. The dealer turns to leave, but never quite makes it out the door. Service agents crash in from the next door and bust him. The dealer's life will never be the same. The stories you just heard are linked. The severed body part from the first story is what was for sale in the second story. More valuable, like I said, than gold or diamonds. Get this, it fetches between twenty-five dollars and $60,000 per kilo on the black market. Today's story is about the arrest of Lumsden Kwan by Operation Crash. The word crash refers to a herd of rhinos, and the object of desire was a rhino horn Okay, I know you might be sitting there thinking about, why is Kim talking about rhino horns in a tech-oriented podcast? Let me tell you something. It's actually all about technology, folks, and it's being developed by Cisco Systems and Dimension Data through a project called Connected Conservation. Because of this technology, rhino poaching in Africa has been reduced by, get this, it's astounding, 96%. And here's another cool part of the story. This same technology may soon be protecting our borders and our schools, but there is a catch. Are we willing to give up even more privacy or the privacy of our children for the sake of this protection? I'm Kim Commando, America's Digital Pro, and in this podcast, we're going to be talking about the latest aviation surveillance and tracking technology that's available on the market. Trust me, your home camera security has nothing on this. This is really important stuff. This is technology that isn't being talked about in the mainstream media. As a matter of fact, we had to do a lot of research even to find anybody to talk to us about this because it's all super secret stuff. It's technology that's being tested to monitor our borders and our schools. And before we get started, a special thank you goes out to our partners in the podcast because they make this podcast possible. There are big bucks in smuggling rhino horns. They're worth between $500,000 and $1 million, somewhere in that arena. Rhinos are an endangered species. They're actually nearly extinct. The manner in which poachers steal their horns is so detestable that big-time celebrities like Prince Harry are joining the fight to protect the rhinos. There's big money and there's big tech on both sides. Can you believe they've even released a cryptocurrency called Rhino Coin? That was just this past month. It's about 71% of the sales that actually pays for the conservation and the protection of the rhinos. I mentioned it in one of my recent Tech News This Week podcasts. You can actually go to rhinocoin.com if you want to check it out. But for now, let's talk about the technology behind this, because this is exactly what affects you and me and our futures. So, yeah, there are big bucks in smuggling rhino horns, but also in smuggling humans. Mexican and Central Americans cough up between nine and $12,000 to enter our United States illegally, and that cost is rising. The rhino game is dangerous, but the human game is way more so. Human victims are left to suffocate in closed vans in the desert heat. Women are raped, children are stolen, and never seen again. Nobody wins except, guess who? 
That's right. The drug dealers, the smugglers, it's the same as the rhino game. As a result, our government went to bed. Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen outlined the department's budget for 2019, which included an expensive overhaul in border surveillance technology. It's not just for our safety, but to protect the immigrants themselves. We have made vast improvements over the past 15 months, but make no mistake, we do face a crisis. We continue to see unacceptable levels of illegal drugs, dangerous gangs, criminal activity, and illegal aliens flow across our southern border. For the second month in a row, we have seen more than 50,000 illegal aliens enter our country. Illicit smuggling groups understand that our ability to actually remove those who come here illegally does not keep pace, so they continue to come back. Fortunately, the president's budget would invest in new border wall construction, technology, and infrastructure to stop illegal activity. To be clear, human smuggling operations are lining the pockets of transnational criminals. They are not humanitarian endeavors. Smugglers prioritize profit over people. And when aliens pay them to get here, they are contributing up to $500 million a year to groups that are fueling greater violence and instability in America. Some big companies are behind this. Cisco, Dimension Data, and Connected Conservation have had so much success catching poachers. You can understand why our government wants to use similar technology to stop the criminal activity at the border and prevent possible shooters from entering our schools. But the basic IT infrastructure, we're talking about access control, manual security processes, and so forth, that's totally old school now. It just doesn't cut it anymore. But here's what does cut it. Let's go back to connected conservation, and let me explain to you the latest and greatest technology that they're using. First up, they've got CCTV analytics ready for action. They create a virtual trip line to detect any suspicious movement. Over time, officials will be able to analyze the data and build these so-called patterns of movement. This gives the operators a heads up when there's any nighttime activity. They also have a network vibration system loaded with sensors, motion sensors, cameras, and microphones. They monitor these massive areas of operation with, thankfully, very little staff. Gunshots can be triangulated with just a few sensors. Drones are then used to locate the poachers so that agents can move in and arrest them. They've got massive outdoor Wi-Fi systems ready to be mounted on mass, which will allow handheld devices and thermal cameras to be viewed and also shared. Connection and communication will be able to take place without any enemy detection, and that's super important. And the finale, they've successfully established a secure, reliable 24-hour network across these vast game reserves in Africa and all adaptable to different weather conditions. And in the future, just waiting in the wings, arrests will probably be made using automated robots and drones. They will reduce the need and the risks associated with human staff. As you can imagine, the United States Armed Forces are all over this. They took it one step further with drones. We dropped it on the 3rd Battalion 7th as they conducted their quads for squads training a few months ago. The men were learning how to operate these really cool small unmanned aircraft systems. And the goal? To use them while deployed in force protection, reconnaissance, and surveillance. Marine First Lieutenant James Brooks explained to us what exactly was going on? So this is the beginning of Quads for Squads training. So a year and a half ago, General Neller made his priority to get every deploying infantry squad a quadcopter. And now we're seeing that uh, idea really come into reality. So we have the equipment. It's durable enough for us. We got the training from Tulsa. And now we're getting uh, everyone we can train on a quadcopter in the squad so that they have the ability to employ quadcopters at the squad level. Drones, flying robots, quadcopters whatever you want to call them. These machines act and think like acrobats. They actually solve physical problems using algorithms. And those algorithms help them learn. Drones can play catch, they can balance, and surprisingly, they can make decisions together. They can even be controlled kinetically. Drone expert Carl Carlson has been involved in physical security management and multiple security and surveillance systems for over 12 years now. He was an unmanned aerial vehicle team leader in northern Iraq for 15 months. 
That's drone in military terms. He's coordinated and he's flown over 100 missions. Carl calls himself a proud U.S. Army veteran who served in ID military intelligence. He spent over a year in eastern Afghanistan and Iraq, leading these surveillance and security missions in support of nearby combat operations. Since then, Carl has worked for a $9 billion real estate and development company, then as the director of security and safety of a $2 billion, 44-acre development in Washington. He has his BA in international affairs, a master's degree in security and safety from none other than George Washington University's Homeland Security Department. So as you can tell, Carl knows his stuff. And Carl, we are so honored to have you on this Commando On Demand podcast. Thank you for having me, Kim. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And you're calling me from Sri Lanka? I am, yes. I'll be here until the 31st of July. Carl, first the simple stuff. Help us visualize how drones work and communicate and say, an alert or maybe a threat situation. Sure. Basically a drone, also known as an unmanned aerial vehicle within the military community, is a multi-rotor or fixed-wing aircraft that is not controlled by an onboard pilot, but remotely by an operator or an onboard computer. And there are always two parts, the drone itself and the control system, sort of like how civilians can use their smartphone to control their drone. They can't stay up there forever. How exactly are they powered? Depending on how advanced and large the drone is, it can be powered by either aircraft fuel, like the Predator that you might have heard of, or a simple lithium-ion battery that can provide 30 to 45 minutes of flight time. My little drone only lasts in the air for, I don't know, 15 to 18 minutes. And when does the military government decide to deploy a drone? What are the certain specifications that they look for? And then what kind of drone would they actually use? The type of craft can depend on the purpose, but primarily they're used where a manned flight would be too difficult, expensive, or dangerous. Now talk a little bit about the tech that they use to track. Like I said, most of our listeners, they already know this, but I'd like everybody to be on the same page. GPS is used to track the aircraft from launch until land, so it always knows where home is when it is commanded to return. For example, if the military or an intelligence agency wants to conduct long-range, high-altitude surveillance, it will use a high-powered drone It can stay in flight for a long period of time and can be controlled from anywhere in the world. Okay, did you catch that? Did you really hear that? Anywhere in the world. Now, that is something else. I was a small UAV team leader in northern Iraq, and our aircraft was perfect for when we wanted to track a vehicle much like you would a poacher, or when we wanted to loiter around a stopped vehicle from just a couple hundred meters above. Or if a law enforcement officer wanted to quickly survey the roof and perimeter of a structure, or even fly down an office building corridor or school hallway, they would use something with a multi-rotor design, much like you find in the commercial marketplace. Let's talk communication for just a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about how it all works. As for communication, A drone would have to be very advanced to be able to distinguish and communicate back to the operator, whether personnel on the ground are friend or foe, unless they were looking for specific markings or you knew your target. But mostly all drones have single or multi-unit camera systems on them, which are providing real-time video and intelligence back to the operator via satellite or an antenna. Carl, we spoke about how Cisco's tech has been able to reduce poaching in Africa by 96%. With the rise of these horrible shooter incidents at our schools throughout the country, how do you think technology like unmanned surveillance aircraft would help us out there? First, it is unfortunate that this topic needs to be addressed so frequently. I have instructed dozens of active shooter response courses to corporate office employees and security officers. And your question is difficult because the intended targets are so different. One enters a wildlife park under the cover of darkness and the other one can be a young adult or a teenager walking into a building at 8 a.m. with a loaded firearm in their backpack. And I want to believe that a drone programmed to hover over a school will eliminate this constant threat, but it will be a challenge to implement. First is the battery replacement issue. So really, instead, if a school wanted constant aerial surveillance, they would need a blimp-supported type camera like we use on borders and in combat zones. But again, that only shows what is going on outside the school, not inside. 
small drone could absolutely be used inside the school, especially if things evolved into a hostage scenario. But law enforcement are trained to enter the building as quickly as possible, search for and eliminate the threat, give the all clear, and then allow medical first responders to enter the school. If launching a small drone does not slow down that initial response and mission to take out the threat, then I would absolutely advocate for it. But a lot of schools are struggling with budgets. Maybe they just can't afford drone protection. Then, of course, the people behind it as well. What are some tech ideas for schools that, say, have these empty pockets? I completely understand that not every school can afford all of this tech. But there are still so many low-cost actions they can take in order to strengthen their security posture. Active shooter training, for example, should be done twice a year. Many school districts are already implementing this into their schedules along with their fire and tornado drills, and that is a very good thing. Administrators should be consistently reaching out to their local police department. Officers are more than willing and happy to come to their school and talk to kids about what an active shooter is, what to listen for, how to remain calm and react. Students will take the training much more serious if they see a uniformed officer instructing the class. Also, installing locks inside classroom doors to make it easier to instantly barricade inside the room and shelter in place is not an expensive measure. And what about, again, reaching out to the local police or sheriff department? They might be able to provide an officer to walk the building for a few hours every day or at least two to three days a week. Okay, those are great ideas for low budgets. Now, what about a school that has some, not a lot of money for technology? What would be a good option for them? then I would recommend installing a camera system in the school which can be monitored at police stations around the jurisdiction. Then officers at the station can provide real-time intelligence to the first officers on the scene. All the station would need is the IP address and a password to remotely log into the school's camera system. And on average, an active shooter incident can be over in two to four minutes and law enforcement response time can be double that. And this is why training and remaining vigilant are so important. I'm with you there. I'm a big believer in human vigilance. But now let's say sky's the limit. We've got an expensive school. They got some big, deep pockets. How much are military-grade drones costing us? Well, a small unmanned aerial vehicle, the aircraft, the hardware, one whole set can be a couple hundred thousand dollars. And that is for something like a fixed wing that you would see in Africa on that sanctuary to catch poachers or like we use in the military in a combat zone. Okay, come on back down to my world, my speed. We're talking like a few hundred bucks. What could we get there? You can get those fixed wing models, like very advanced, you know, top selling models in the commercial market for a few hundred dollars. And that's what a lot of law enforcement uses. It's these ones that you can carry in a backpack and you simply turn them on and then they can hover and you can tell them right, left, straight, up, down, forward and give them clear direction. So, Carl, with your vast experience in the military, you've seen a lot. You've seen America's true enemies. You know what they're capable of, technologically speaking. Can you comment a little bit about that? Yes. I think it is a safe assessment to say that the United States consistently leads the way with military technology. But that does not mean we are always on the offensive. Other nations, such as China, Russia, North Korea have proven to be very impactful with their cyber campaigns, and that is something we need to stay on top of. For example, the United States has 19 aircraft carriers, and the rest of the world has 12 combined. But look at China's current influence in the South China Sea. And my point is, foreign powers have a lot of influence right now, and you do not always need the most tanks to carry out an agenda. Additionally, military adversaries have the funding to purchase or just copy technology. China's large UAV right now, it looks exactly like the Predator's twin sister, and that is not a coincidence. I know you're speaking from actual experience, not from just, say, going to Google and typing in. I'm saying search engine knowledge. I spent over two years in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the sort of weapon systems that my friends and I would come in contact with would not win uh, any tech show blue ribbons, but they were very effective. Small rocket launchers and mortars are easily transported and can be fired at forces from a couple miles away with impressive accuracy from the back of a pickup truck. And look at the sort of impact that IEDs have had on the battlefield. I would not call IEDs a technological breakthrough by any means. 
they're responsible for the injuries and deaths of thousands of servicemen and women. So at the end of the day, I think that an enemy will always find a way to fight with or without the latest technology. Yet we will have the naysayers, Carl. They believe that employing drones, artificial intelligence, and this whole Internet of Things communication at the border could be maybe even over the top. I disagree with the notion that employing drones, AI, and Internet of Things is going overboard. These are systems that can be tethered hundreds of feet up in the air and through the use of infrared technology, easily spot the heat signatures coming off of personnel who might be attempting to illegally cross into the United States. And ground surveillance systems can also be buried and then communicate movement to border agents, much like I used in Afghanistan. The technology is available, so I support using it, especially if it keeps personnel safe. Carl, I totally agree with you. And if we are talking about our southern border, I would question what our relationship is like with our friends down there. Are there incentives for them to assist us so we are not doing it alone? And would we share some of our technology with them? Would we cross-train them? So yes, there is a need to survey the border, and I think it can be done with strong international partnerships, smart technology, and ethical enforcement. You know who else agrees with you? Our U.S. Homeland Secretary. She just put in a huge budget proposal for more manpower and more technology. That's good, because they will definitely be used. Yeah, you know what, Carl? I I agree with that. So let's end on a positive note. You're on holiday going around the entire world. Tell us what you've learned so far. I have been to 31 countries in 14 months, and it continues to be an amazing experience. And I have definitely noticed a couple of things. And number one, despite ongoing armed conflicts around the world and a lot of global political unease, there are so many good people out there that love to help a foreigner. I've been invited into homes for a meal and tea at the last minute. And a couple of months ago, a farmer in the hills of Kyrgyzstan did not think twice when he allowed me to take his horse for a spin in the valley. Gosh, Carl, that is so cool and encouraging. Gosh, I wish I could go with you. The need for security is not going away. In many European high-threat cities, it does not take long to find law enforcement or military patrolling around the Louvre, for example, with automatic weapons. Just to ride the metro in Almaty, Kazakhstan, you have to first pass through a metal detector and put your bag on an x-ray belt. I wish we could all live in harmony, but unfortunately that is not reality. Some cities have an extremely heavy law enforcement presence, but many of those officers accept bribes instead of issue tickets. I have been in supermarkets where the security staff is distracted because they are unloading produce trucks. So security definitely does not mean the same thing once you begin crossing borders. And I've been making some notes along the way, and when I return back to the U.S., I might turn it into a book, Physical Security, A Global Perspective, or something like that. But for now, just enjoying seeing the world, meeting great people, and eating amazing food. Physical security, a global perspective. It sounds interesting. Can you be sure and let us know when it comes out? I really want to know. I will. Absolutely. That's great, Carl. Thank you so much for taking time to share what you know and also for your service to our country. We all appreciate you. Thank you very much, Kim. I appreciate it. And I look forward to listening to the podcast. So again, let's get back to the issue of school safety. Say there's a shooter. We could eliminate the threat a lot quicker if we could triangulate him or her. I mean, the response time could conceivably be cut in half, at least. The communication between classrooms would be almost instantaneous, and they would be able to lock down. Boom! Just like that. Even with just one AI in surveying the property, we're talking about bullying, violence, abuse, and harassment, they're more likely to be spotted, if not recorded. And then, of course, think where else we could go with this. Facial recognition could step in put two and two together, and then the trouble would supposedly end. It kind of sounds like this utopian science fiction movie. I certainly hope it works. But with new security technology comes, well, new bullying technology. Kids are bullying each other online now, and most parents would never even know about it. Sexual harassment happens online under cover of encrypted passwords. Neo-Nazi groups are recruiting depressed and suicidal kids through online games. In secret, I'm talking about one-on-one communication. And I hate to tell you this, parents, the ball is still squarely in your court. You've got to watch what your kids do online. It's just that simple. In just a few moments, inside the security walls of cyberspace, 
I mean, where do you think terrorists get their intel from nowadays anyway? It's not just some guy in a red and white scarf snapping pictures with a cell phone. It's likely to be a kid, a hacker, maybe making a few extra bucks for what he or she has been told is perfectly a good cause. In fact, the technology that Cisco uses to protect rhinos is very similar to how companies like FireEye protect clients against electronic intrusions. You see, firewalls and perimeter protections, they are old school now. Firewalls are way more porous now. If you don't believe me, just listen to my Tech News This Week podcast. That's when companies begin trending towards in-depth protection. And of course, we need more artificial intelligence to get the job done. And that means we need more people who understand the capabilities of AI, how to use it the right way and the wrong way. So stay with us. Here's a word from our sponsor. Let's go inside the security walls of cyberspace. I'd like you to meet FireEye's executive VP and chief corporate strategy officer, a gentleman by the name of John Waters. To combat cyber threats, he oversees a unified global network of network intelligence experts worldwide. Now, I'm familiar with John. He's a well-respected expert, and boy, is he ever outspoken when it comes to threat intelligence. His main soapbox these days warning companies about the shifting inner workings of cyber threat intel, as he admitted so much in the CyberScoop interview. So, John, what's the difference between threat intelligence and other cybersecurity practices? Well, I mean, the most important difference is it's dynamic. It changes every day. The world around us changes, and you have to take that difference and drive that into your tools and practices. But as you know, through any bureaucracy, change is typically pretty hard to execute. So there tends to be a lag effect between what's in case, you know, best practice and what types of tools you're using from the actual change in the threat environment. I know a lot of companies get blindsided when they're hacked and they end up reacting to a breach that seemed to come from out of nowhere. So how can intelligence professionals develop, say, a more proactive approach instead of just reacting to what happens? For the most part, there's no such thing as a pace in zero. You're almost very rarely, you know, catch the very first iteration of something. So therefore, if you're seeing something in your environment, it's probably been seen somewhere before. So one company or entity or agency's reactive can be the next company or agency's proactive, you know, if you learn from lessons learned around you. So uh, the idea of intelligence is how do you gain that, that knowledge of change in the threat environment, no matter where it's happening in the world, and leverage that to your advantage. So when it comes, you know, soon to a theater near you, you've already built in your protective layer to protect against that threat that you've never seen before, but somebody else has. How do you see threat intelligence supporting other security practices taking place? SOC system. Well, you've got a SOC uh, role tactically, which is how you shrink the problem from all these raw alerts down to what's actionable and relevant to their organization. Um, and intelligence is the mechanism by which you do that. So if you have a you know, billion raw alerts and you have maybe a thousand critical alerts, but you have time to deal with 10, intelligence allows you to correlate those critical alerts to the actual threat context that says, oh, these are the 10 most important risks to my organization. That's what my limited resources are going to apply their skills to today. Uh, so it really helps the SOC make that tactical decision report, but aligned with the overall risk objectives of the firm. So what would you suggest for upgrading the, I guess you'd say, the maturity level, if you will, of a certain company's security operations? Yeah, I think they, they should look at it both tactically and strategically. Uh, and it starts off with integration. You know, there's threat data. So a lot of people sell and merchandise is, hey, these are bad IOCs or, you know, red, whitelist, blacklist kind of things. But if there's no threat context behind it, you really don't know what to do about it. Someone just says, oh, this is bad. But it might have been bad a year ago or a month ago or a week ago, but it's not bad today. So you can't really action that. So the key is to get data integrated inside your environment from a, from a telemetry connect to that data through an API set that then relates to the actual threat context. So you say, oh, okay, this data relates to this adversary. It's part of this campaign. Here's what they're trying to do so you know what to action. So integration is really important to get that data integrated into your environment and then connect that data to the threat context. And then deciding on what's important um, is really a strategic objective. So how the strategy setters of the organization can say, here are the core threats that we're concerned about as an organization. If you see any data that connects to a group that's trying to execute one of those core threats, those are the top five risks that we're really worried about. So that takes you know, priority one over everything else and aligns the objectives of managing risk with the senior executives all the way down to the tactical operators. Thanks a million for sharing that, John. I definitely want him on my team. 
All right, last stop. Where else? We're going to the airport. Have you been to the airport lately? It's almost like a choreographed dance of technology and human security, intuition, and of course, frustration, and of course, aggravation. It's all rolled up into this one stressful experience. But have you noticed, as the terrorist threats get more serious, flying is actually getting less stressful. TSA and the FAA are actually dialing it in, and it's getting noticeably better. So let's check in with private pilot and airport management executive, John McCoy. He's been in aviation his entire adult life. From inline mechanics to airport management, he's pretty much done it all. Currently, he's an aviation technology writer and consultant for the air travel industry. Hey there, John. Welcome to this Commando On Demand podcast. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate that. It's good to be on here. I thought it was interesting when you said in your email that drones are forbidden in and around airports. I've read about that and known about that for years. But can you explain why? Drones aren't necessarily expressly forbidden at airports, but they have to be approved by both the airport operator, which is usually the city or municipality, and then also the air traffic control agency, which is most of the time is the FAA. So they have to get the sign off and the blessing on both of those. And the reason for that is because of a concern of mixing unmanned aircraft into an environment where you have manned aircraft flying actively at low levels where they can definitely mix up with each other. And this is a particular concern of airports that are called air carriers, so passenger carrying airports. So we're talking about interference. Do you think maybe even the smaller ones could be used indoors somehow for security? Indoor use would be fine. Anytime that they're tethered or contained, generally then it falls outside of the scope of what the FAA is concerned about. So that wouldn't necessarily be a no-go. It's interesting that you make that distinction, John, because we all know that AI is in full swing in some places. Companies are using robots to spot violence, harassment, suspicious behavior, and stuff like that. So at some future point, do you think that robots could be deployed in airports too, like maybe follow suspicious people around? Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily far-fetched. I'm not sure how much airport security is going to want to get away from the human element of actually having their security staff being the ones physically following if it gets to that point, but having the retina scanners and the facial recognition capability to actually pick them up as they enter the terminal or even on the roadways entering the airport so they can flag them before they even touch a building. And they're working towards that. We're going to talk about that new technology after our chat here, but here's the deal. Airline terrorism is changing. I guess you know all about that. I personally think that the groups that are promoting terrorist attacks have probably seen aviation as an asset. I think that they have found social media to be a much more effective weapon to target their um, efforts on. And so aviation isn't being used like it was in the 70s and 80s and 90s by terrorist organizations. It's, It's moved into the cyberspace. Yes, and the recruiting targets are mostly just kids. We're talking about gamers, depressed teens, the most vulnerable ones. And school children are still vulnerable to all sorts of attack. It's horrific. I don't know how much more you can rely on technology when I think that the real big picture issue with school safety is more human intelligence. I mean, you look at the recent incidents that have happened and the human intelligence is all there. I mean, technology wasn't going to help change that. They needed to act on human intelligence that was procured at the ground level. So you're more of a proponent of human security. Keep your eyes open, be aware of your surroundings, go with your gut instinct. We're talking about good old fashioned HI, not AI, HI for human intelligence. Absolutely. And it's shown, I mean, we've we've seen that the human intelligence was there. People were watching. People were concerned. Tech wasn't going to change that. Tech gives us some great tools. But if you don't ever act on them, what difference does it make how good your tech is if you're not actually following up on a legitimate threat? John, that's a good point. And yeah, at the same time, we have some really cool tech. Facial recognition helps prevent thousands of terrorist attacks. And you never hear about it in the news, which actually may be a good thing. But now they're using it to nab repeat offenders and wanted criminals, too. So if you want to marry that with fast response robots, these solutions could cover some huge areas. That's where the technology is headed. In fact, this past May in Dubai, there was a huge airport technology show. Everybody was absolutely floored by Cinecloud Wisdom's brand new check-in and baggage drop-off AI robots. Let me tell you, these guys are out of Beijing, and get this. They avoid obstacles 
and they transport your bags to the baggage handling area. All you need to do as the traveler, just scan your passport, put your bags in a robot, and go straight to the security checkpoint. No more agents weighing your bag, rifling through the bag before you're even a suspect. So that's nice. But here's the best part. Instead of looking for the ticket desk, you can check in and drop your bags off from anywhere in the airport with one of these super duper robots. Talk about a time saver. Imagine if they were just at the curb. Everyone also raved about the artificial intelligent check-in counter. So this guy can do facial recognition, baggage weighing, all the mundane stuff. The whole package is called the Smart Airport, and it's totally based on the Internet of Things technology. The Department of Homeland Security is developing its own Smart Airport through Kaggle Data, by the way. It's all really great stuff, and it's all coming up. You want to know about this. So, John, I didn't mean to steal your thunder, but based on your experience, do you think all those things are finally going to help air travel be less stressful? Oh, tremendously. I think it'd be great. If anything, I think the general search has done nothing but create hostility from people that never were a threat in the first place. We have the technology now to identify threats and people that are on watch lists. I mean, all those people be picked up before they're ever even in the threshold of the airport. Why do you need people wanting over and frisking the elderly? Uh, I don't. I think all that's done is created contention. And I think that this is one area where robotics and technology is a huge boom. Yeah, maybe so. I am noticing that I get searched less and less when I travel. Sometimes they just wave me through. I wonder if that's what you're talking about. Saving, say, manpower. It will end up costing the airlines and the airports uh, significantly less in manpower. I mean, I think a lot of people argue is not being particularly well used. That's kind of weird coming from you, but I have to agree with you sometimes, especially when I'm sitting in Phoenix and I'm thinking, okay, I need to go to Las Vegas. It's a six hour drive, but it's two hours in the airport there, two hours on the way back. Sometimes I sit and go, maybe we should just drive. Well, I think so. I think there's been so much public backlash. And quite frankly, you know, airlines have a vested interest in keeping their passengers safe. It it does them no favors to have unsafe passengers. So they will gladly spend the money to bring in technology that will make their passengers not disgruntled. They'll keep happy passengers. They'll make people want to fly. You know, I I hate traveling because I don't want to deal with TSA. And I would rather drive half the time. But seriously, what's the holdup? If our tech is so far advanced, why aren't we seeing it in the United States airports? All the pushback, quite frankly, is because the bureaucracy is a B in the FAA is the prime example. I mean, their, their concern is they just can't keep up with the technology, but the technology is revolutionizing aerospace and aviation right in front of our eyes. I mean, the only thing that's limiting it is red tape because otherwise it, it will advance faster than we can really even keep up with. So they're resistant to change, but one day soon, They're going to look up in the sky and see something that they're not going to like. Whether they like it or not, it will move into personal travel, you know, personal commuting. I mean, the technology is there. It's light years ahead of where general aviation was even just 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, Coming from a person that works in the industry, I mean, it's going to revolutionize it because the cost of these apparatuses is just a tiny fraction of what helicopters and personal aircraft are with similar capabilities. I totally want one of these, but we're going to have to say that for another podcast. Hey, John, if companies want to get a hold of you, where can they go? You can find me at John McCoy 9 on Upwork, and I do independent consulting on Maven, and you can look me up on there just by name. And also LinkedIn. It's uh, LinkedIn.com and John McCoy Wright. We appreciate your input, John. You've really shared so much with us. And I really appreciate you being a guest here on Commando On Demand. Thank you, Kim. I really appreciate it. And it was a great time uh, talking to you. Gosh, this was just a crazy podcast, wasn't it? We went from the plains of Africa to a marine drone operation, to a government briefing, and then to cyberspace at our airports. So what was the point? Here's the deal. To get to the lowdown on the latest surveillance technology that is currently being deployed to keep our schools, our borders, our cyberspace safe, of course, We all have to ask the ethical question, are we losing our freedoms in the process or are we actually gaining it? I think it depends on how you define American freedom. The preamble to our constitution does allow us to provide for the common defense, ensure domestic tranquility, and promote the general welfare. If you're not sure what American freedom represents, do some traveling like our guest Carl 
and form an opinion based on your experience. I've traveled the world and I have to tell you, there's no better place than the United States of America. We do have the freedom to have an opinion. We do have the freedom to speak our mind when we feel like something's not right. And that accounts for everything. I'm Kim Commando. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. And I'm inviting you to look up, look out, be aware of your surroundings, learn more about your technology, and have just an amazing life. To find my show nearest you, head over to commando.com slash radio. And if you want to watch or listen to my show anytime on your schedule, go behind the scenes, watch the show being recorded, use our message boards, be part of the community, head over to getkim.com. Once again, that's getkim.com. And I'll see you next time.